This is Career Spotlight featuring lawyer Talon Regent from Regent Law here in Moose Jaw. Um, this session will be recorded for students to use later. Any students who want to um, view the, the session can also um, fill in the survey following their viewing and uh, that will give us some feedback on how to do a better job of these um, sessions and also give you an opportunity to maybe win some money. Um, so with that, I will click a few times and get, uh, get going for Mr. Regent. Share that. Oops. Just one second. Let's see if I can stop my video first. Always something, right? There it is. <laughs> there it is. Now I'm ready to roll. Okay. Good to go. Perfect. So welcome students. Hello. Uh, this presentation is going to be all about the practice of law. And something that you'll quickly realize as I describe the practice, one of the biggest things that I can emphasize is just how broad the practice of law can be. There is literally a field of law for absolutely everything. Hairstyling. I think it was Justin Bieber that had his hair insured for about a million dollars so that it, his hairstylist uh, was taking the buzz razor, accidentally sneezed and shaved his head while it was insured for a million dollars. And some lawyer had to come up with the wording on how to properly insure hair. So it, that is one really niche field of law. And then you've also got others where we are now getting into space. We've got regular moon landings. We have people trying to get to Mars. How are we going to govern ourselves in the world and beyond? There are lawyers that are trying to draft the legislation, the rules for all of those kinds of things. So it is a very, very broad field of practice. It's a huge career and you can get as niche or stay as broad as you want. For me, I, I am a small urban sole practitioner. And so I'm practicing in Moose Jaw. My firm is called Regent Law. I own it, I operate it, and I'm the only lawyer there. So because I'm the only lawyer there and because I'm in a smaller community, I like to keep a general practice. And that means that I will do everything from drafting people's wills to running criminal appeals. And along with that, I have a huge passion for technology, which is one of the reasons I was listed as one of Canada's top 25 most influential lawyers in 2020. It was a, a great honor to be listed. You often see judges at the Supreme Court of Canada listed on there. So to be among those types of individuals, that was very flattering. And so jumping right along, I mentioned it's broad, and one of the first ways that we can narrow down the scope of the practice of law is to divide people between solicitors and barristers. And uh, for a little bit of the lingo, uh, barristers, that's the term that you'll hear from England and the United States, they use the term litigator. And Canada, we're always caught in the middle between which uh, phrasing we should use. Uh, but I personally like to use barrister, and I think most Canadian lawyers like that. So when it comes to solicitors, those are your paper-based lawyers. Those are the lawyers that are drafting the terms of agreement. Uh, they're drafting those terms and conditions that you never read when you're signing up to a new website. They're the ones doing wills, house sales, and house purchases. Anytime you're reading something and it really feels like there's legalese, it really feels like some lawyer drafted it, that's because a lawyer probably did. And we call those ones solicitors. Then you have your barristers. Those are the ones that you're going to see on TV because if we're being honest, the solicitor's job tends to be a little bit more mundane, a little bit more boring. And so it's not really TV worthy. But when you see those lawyers yelling at one another in court, when you see them arguing or getting into a negotiation and it's getting really heated, those are your barristers. They're all about dispute resolution. 
And back in the day, it used to be all about court, but court has become way too expensive for most people. The court system is bogged down. It could take a year or longer to get to a trial. So these days we're really emphasizing not just court as a dispute resolution mechanism, but also things like negotiation, things like mediation, where you have a neutral third party helping people to reach an agreement. And so those are all the jobs of barristers. And I, so then what, what does a lawyer actually do? I, beyond just yelling at somebody or writing documents, what are their duties? I, I love the story of uh, Lord Henry Burham. Uh, he was representing the Queen of England against the King of England. The King was trying to charge the Queen with adultery and Lord Henry Burham, uh, he threatened the King. He threatened the King and said, if you pursue these charges against your wife, I am going to reveal to the public your secret extramarital affairs. And when he was questioned about how he could put the dignity of the throne in jeopardy, he said, an advocate in the discharge of his duty knows but one person in all the world, and that person is his client. So that's really what the practice of law comes down to. You could be doing 101 different things in a day, but every single thing that you're doing is an attempt to further your client's interest whether that is helping to defend somebody in a criminal law trial, or if it's negotiating in a divorce because your client wants more time with the kids, whatever it could possibly be, you are an advocate for your client and you are trying to better their position, either in life or in a negotiation, whatever is necessary. Beyond that, there are some other considerations. We, as lawyers, owe a duty to the administration of justice. Um, a lot of people will hear uh, Shakespeare quote about killing all the lawyers, but most people don't actually get the context of that. The context was actually two spies in a Shakespearean play trying to figure out how to undermine the stability of a country. And they decided that one of the best ways to undermine the stability of a country was to get rid of all the lawyers. And so it was actually a huge compliment to lawyers indicating that we are one of the main stabilizers in a society. When people have a dispute, when people have an argument that they can't resolve on their own, they get lawyers involved to help them resolve it. And so we have a duty to society to make sure that things run smoothly. And finally, we also have a duty to courts. And the big thing there is that I could not just walk into a courtroom and start lying on behalf of the client. If I did that, I would get disbarred very quickly. I might even get thrown in jail for something like perjury. So we have a duty, not just to our client, but also a duty to society to make sure that we're conducting ourselves honorably. From there, uh, when it comes to the actual day-to-day, -day, solicitors, they are doing research and writing almost constantly. So if, if somebody walks into my office and says, I've got this great business idea, it's really innovative, but I'm worried about how it's actually going to play out legally. I, I don't think it's a crime to just dump toxic waste in the river, but if my business model was to be profitable, I'd have to do that. So can I do that? Is, is that allowed? Um, and if it is allowed, how do I go about it without uh, wrecking the or finding myself in breach of the environmental laws? If somebody came to me and asked me that, that would be a solicitor question. So if I don't know the answer to that question, and I'm not expected to know the answer to absolutely every legal question under the sun but I am expected to be able to research it, find the correct answer, and give my client the correct answer. But oftentimes, there is no one single correct answer. And so I'm not just giving a yes or a no response, I'm giving an analysis. I'm looking at all the different environmental laws that a municipality might have, that a province might have, that the federal government might have, and I'm looking to see 
what can and cannot be done within those rules. Uh, now, that being said, I can promise you that we do have rules against dumping toxic waste in the river. So don't worry about that one. So that is really the day to day. And most of that is done via the internet these days. Back in the day, there would be actual law libraries and they would have piles and piles of books from the floor to the ceiling. And those would be your resources. Luckily, all of that has been compiled into online databases. So it's just a matter of figuring out where to look. Beyond that, uh, there is also the communication aspect. Lots of clients tend to be a little bit needy. And so you're going to end up uh, having to email them, phone calls with them, in-person meetings when you don't have COVID to deal with, and you're going to need to do video conferences. So having that communication and really getting to the bottom of what the client wants is important. And if you don't ask the right questions, you might not actually define the issue properly. And that's something I see a fair bit in family law, which even though it's a barrister situation, it's still just as relevant on the solicitor side. Uh, a person might say, uh, how do I get all the time with my child? And even though that's the initial question they're asking, when I start to probe a little bit deeper, what they're really looking for is to protect the best interests of their children. And initially they thought that might have been by keeping their ex-spouse out of the equation altogether and their ex-spouse should have no time with the kids. But once I confirm that they're actually looking out for the best interest of their kids, then we can have a conversation about child psychological development and the necessity that somebody have two parents in their life to be able to fully develop emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, and it allows us to have a much deeper conversation. So really making sure to have good conversations with clients is hugely important. So then on the barrister side, we end up with everything that solicitors do and more. And there's always a bit of a competition between solicitors and barristers. Uh, barristers will often joke that they're better than solicitors because they're always cleaning up solicitors' mistakes. If the solicitors had good, solid agreements in place right from the get-go that were clear and there was no room for ambiguity, then a barrister would not have a job. The solicitor's agreement or contract that they drafted would always resolve the issue. But when there's th that ambiguity, and especially with politicians too, Lots of politicians are not lawyers, they don't think like lawyers, and so they don't, they don't clarify all of those ambiguous aspects when they pass new legislation. And so then it's up to the barristers and the judges to figure it out. So how they go about figuring it out? The court process is one of those ways, and that's what you're going to see most times if you're watching a legal drama or a movie about lawyers. You're gonna see them running a trial, you're gonna see them zealously trying to persuade a jury that their client is, is innocent, and you're going to see a judge or the jury rendering a verdict at the end of the day. Uh, before you ever get to that point, because that can cost a client tens of thousands of dollars. So before you ever go to that worst case scenario of having to run a trial, you're going to be negotiating. And so you're going to be getting in touch with the other lawyer, trying to figure out what the other person actually wants out of it and seeing if you can reach a middle ground. And oftentimes I, you're going to be trying to figure out what the most cost effective resolution is. Sometimes my clients will end up negotiating a deal where they get $10,000 less than they really ought to. And they might get $10,000 less than they should have if they went to the end of the trial. But if they went to the end of the trial, they might have to pay me $20,000. So even if they win, which is never guaranteed, they're still going to end up with $10,000 less in their pocket at the end of the day. And so that's where you start to see room for negotiations and resolutions outside of court. And if you have to go to court, and if you're really going that barrister direction, then you're also going to see a lot of prep for trial. It is not just a matter of uh, walking in and having a silver tongue. 
you need to do a ton of prep work. You need to uh, prep your witnesses so that they understand what the trial is all about, so that they understand what kinds of questions they're probably going to be asked. They're, you're going to need to gather evidence. And you're not personally going to be showing up at crime scenes to gather evidence, but you're going to be coordinating with private investigators, you're going to be coordinating with witnesses, you're going to be telling the client to take photographs of their house, all sorts of different things. And so that is what a barrister is doing. From there, we have uh, the different types of equipment that we use. On the solicitor side, it's all office-based. Uh, you are working with email, you're working with Microsoft Word and Excel or other uh, word processing tools. You've got video conferencing like I'm doing right now. You have legal research tools which start to get a little bit more unique along with those precedents. Um, the legal research tools, it would be insane to try and comb through every single case on a given issue. We have hundreds of decisions being read, rendered every single day from judges across the country. And to try and keep up with all of that would be next to impossible. So we need to make sure that we have tools available that if we get a really niche question, we can find the answer. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked um, by a woman, she uh, was, she was artificially, uh, or she was helped to get pregnant through in vitro fertilization. But the guy that donated the sperm, he ended up uh, falling in love with this woman, but she was actually in a lesbian relationship with another woman. So how do we decide on parenting of that child when we've got three parents involved? Two biological, two by a relationship, and it, it's not something that has ever been dealt with in a court before. So it, when I'm trying to give my client a clear answer on how it would likely be dealt with in court, I need to try and do some research, not on that issue because it's never been seen before, but on similar issues. Um, so maybe there are other uh, gay couples that have a child and the biological parents are getting involved and there's a dispute. So those types of research questions are, uh, those types of research tools are essential to our practice. Likewise, when it comes to precedents, uh, when a lawyer is doing up a 100 page terms and conditions document, we're not typing that out every single time we need to do something like that from one client to the next. We're going to go to our resources, we're going to find another lawyer that has drafted a similar type of document we're going to plagiarize and we're going to manipulate it so that it works for our particular circumstance. And that's one of my favorite things about the practice of law is that plagiarism is not only acceptable, but it's actually encouraged. Because all of these different contracts get challenged in court all the time, we, we start to learn and we start to see a pattern of what types of phrasing the judges want to see for particular areas of the contract. And so if, after we've seen a hundred different cases dealing with uh, one particular issue, then we can come up with basically a perfect paragraph that nobody is ever going to misunderstand, nobody is ever going to question, and a judge is going to accept it every single time. And then the community of lawyers will share that amongst ourselves so that we can create certainty in the law and certainty in the contracts. And the last one is tracking your time. Lawyers, we don't, we don't sell products. We don't sell contracts. We don't sell wills. Uh, we don't sell legal advice. We sell time. I bill out my time at $325 an hour right now. And that gets broken down to $32.50 for every six minute time period. And I need to keep track of my time because if I don't, I'm not going to get paid at the end of the day. So I need to keep myself accountable for every six minutes of my day. And some people do not enjoy that in the slightest. So they end up taking a different model with their practice of law. But I'll touch on that in a bit. 
when it comes to other spaces that we work in, the barristers, they'll end up working in courtrooms. And the photo that you see on this slide, that is an actual courtroom here in Saskatchewan. I believe that one's in Regina. And so in it, you'll see all of the classic highlights that you might see in any of those lawyer movies. Uh, you've got the judge that sits at the front, you have the lawyers that sit just in front of the judge, you have the panel, the jury off to the side, the, uh, if it's a criminal jury case, you'll ha often have the criminal behind, or the alleged criminal behind the glass, if there's a safety risk. And then uh, all trials, all court activity, barring a few exceptions, is open to the public. If you really started to get uh, the idea that you wanted to become a lawyer, and particularly a barrister, then you could simply walk into the courthouse and sit down and observe and maybe spend a day just watching the lawyers talking to each other, see how they interact with their clients, see how they interact with the judge and the bailiff and the sheriff and all the courthouse staff and really just soak it all in. And that will give you uh, a pretty good idea of what to expect when you're in the practice of law. So uh, keep that in mind and uh, check out your nearest courtroom if you're ever interested. Some likely unknown duties, emotional counseling is the biggest one. They will, look, they will warn you about this when you get to law school, but before I ever got to law school, I had no idea just how much time I would spend consoling people and telling people that everything's going to be okay. Uh, oftentimes, lawyers are helping people when they are in their darkest period in their life, going through a divorce, dealing with the death of a loved one, contemplating their own passing away if they're doing up a will. And for a lot of people, that can be very, very challenging emotionally. And they're going to be looking to their lawyer to tell them that everything's going to be okay. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes I have to tell my clients that everything is not going to be okay, that there is no strength in their legal position and they have no hope of overcoming it. And having those difficult conversations usually means that I need a Kleenex box beside me so that they can dry their tears and so that I can help them get to a, the point where they're accepting their reality and then we can talk about going forward. And in a perfect world, that wouldn't be part of my job. In a perfect world, they would be going to a psychologist or they'd be going to a counselor before they come to my office so that they can get to a point where they accept their situation. And then when they get to my office, we can just have a good conversation about the law. But that's not the reality. From there, political advocacy is a huge one. I just finished a case and, and my client has allowed me to speak publicly about it. I, I just finished a case where a woman passed away in a care home and it was because of the negligence of the care provider. The care home did not have enough staff. They weren't checking on their elderly, uh, their elderly attendants. And because of that, uh, this particular woman passed away. Unfortunately, one of the legal realities is that that type of claim to try and sue that care home would be a huge uphill battle because the legislation in place right now is nearly non-existent and trying to hold them accountable when we don't have laws enabling us to hold them accountable becomes quite challenging. So oftentimes, not only am I trying to advocate for a client in the courtroom, but I'm also trying to advocate for a client in the political sphere where I'm contacting politicians, MLAs, MPs, and I'm saying, you know what, there is a serious problem with the way this piece of legislation is worded and it's allowing harm to come to people in society when that isn't the intention. So you need to get involved with your other uh, members of the legislative assembly, or if it's federal, members of parliament, you need to get in touch with all of these other politicians and you need to make an amendment to this wording because it's having some problematic consequences. 
And finally, there's the business management side. If you're going to be running your own practice, if you're going to be your own boss, then of course you're going to end up with all of the business management issues. Uh, you're going to have to do your own bookkeeping. You're going to have to do your own human resources. Uh, you're going to have to do your own marketing, all that good stuff. But even beyond just uh, working for yourself, if you're going to be working in a large firm of 250 people, a lot of that stuff is going to be uh, covered by actual paid employees that are professionals in those areas, except when it comes to networking especially. Most law firms are set up in such a way that your compensation is tied to your ability to find new clients. So if you want to make any decent money as a lawyer, you're going to need to get out into your community, you're going to need to meet people, develop a good reputation, and start bringing in clients. So that type of networking is essential to a successful career as a lawyer. And collections is often something that you'll have to do on your own as well. Finally, uh, when we get into the pros and cons, uh, the rewards are, for most people, wonderful. Uh, you get paid a fair bit of money as compared to most people. You get a lot of influence, a lot of power uh, within your community. Everybody is looking for a lawyer to be on a board of directors. And that's because they're looking for those legal insights that a lawyer can provide. So if, when I first got into practice in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, I, within a couple of months, probably had 10 or 15 inv invitations to jump onto all sorts of boards, whether it's for uh, nonprofit charities, whether it's for things like uh, the SPCA, uh, caring for animals, uh, all the way up to medical boards and review boards, uh, administrative boards, where I'd actually be getting paid a bit of money, just to make sure that when these organizations are making decisions, they're making lawful decisions. So you get power when, you, when you're a lawyer. As well, it also comes with a fair bit of respect and prestige. Some people will give you a hard time, and I do I get the occasional ribbing where somebody will uh, joke about lawyers being shady or scummy or snakes or sharks or things like that. But by and large, people hear that you're a lawyer and instantly they, they have more respect for you and they're willing to listen to you more than they would another individual. Uh, for a lot of my clients, I will say the exact same thing that they've said, but when I say it and when I write it, I put it on my letterhead. And my letterhead says Regent Law in big bold letters at the top, and all of a sudden, I can get the problem solved when my client couldn't, and the only difference is that it's coming from a lawyer instead of just some member of the public. And the last one, which is a huge factor for me, is the satisfaction of helping people when they're in their darkest hour. Um, the, one of the biggest highlights to my career in terms of that satisfaction came actually while I was in law school. I was volunteering and I helped a refugee stay in Canada. And when I was doing that, I, I was able to persuade the refugee board that if he was sent home, he would be beheaded within a matter of about 10 days. And, and quite literally, he might not have even made it out of the airport before he would, was snatched away and killed. And so to, to literally save a man's life and, and help him to stay in Canada, that was a huge highlight of my career. And the occasional case that I have, like that one, reminds me of one of the reasons that I got into this business. Now, unfortunately, there are some challenges and some stresses at the same time. You are going to have long, long hours if you decide that you're going to get into private practice and you're going to work in a big firm. If you're working in a smaller community like Mooshka, or if you're working as in-house counsel, then it's a lot better. You're probably going to be able to get away with a 40-hour work week. But that is very much considered the minimum for lawyers. And if you're trying to make it big, if you're trying to
become one of the top lawyers in your industry, in your community, and you're looking at Vancouver or Toronto or Calgary, you can expect to be working minimum 60 hours a week, probably 80 hours a week. And that for most people is not sustainable. So as they start to get burnt out and as they're feeling the pressure from their bosses to work harder and harder and work longer and longer, some of them will end up turning to things like cocaine. They'll end up turning to things like Adderall or Ritalin because they need something to help them focus and stay awake and keep working. And coffee just does not cut it. Uh, in addition to that, we deal with dark, to dark topics. I was talking about the guy that I, I helped to stay in Canada and, and helped to avoid him being beheaded upon return to his country. There was the possibility that I would lose that case. And if I lost that case, I would go home that night knowing that he was being shipped off back to a country that was going to behead him. And that would have been something that would have kept me awake at night for months, probably years later. And I deal with those types of things on a near daily basis. I'm dealing with criminal law matters where somebody is accused of murder or sexual assault or any number of other heinous crimes. And dealing with those types of topics I can lead a lot of lawyers to fall into depression. And then I, in addition, if if it wasn't just that you're dealing with dark topics, and this is what distinguishes lawyers from uh, people like police officers, doctors, uh, and other people that deal with dark topics. When it comes to lawyers, everybody's an opponent. Everybody's an enemy. You're always, you're always combative. And you're fighting against other lawyers. You're fighting against other parties. Uh, whoever your client has an issue with. And oftentimes you're fighting with your own client. Uh, it's, it can be a, a thankless job because usually, uh, I shouldn't say usually, but often, even if you manage to get a best case outcome for your client, they're gonna complain that their bill is too high. So it, it can be awfully thankless in a way that you don't see with other professionals. But, Hopefully that doesn't scare you away. And uh, when it comes to our next slide, uh, we have a little bit of incentive. So yes, it's, it's hard and it's challenging, but one of the first things that you see on this slide is the salary range. And the salary can be pretty good. And this uh, salary range that I've provided, those are the averages. So if you want to work harder, or if you are particularly uh, good at finding new clients, if you're particularly good at your job and people consider you essential, you can certainly make more than this. Uh, for the small urban category that I'm in, I've only been in practice for four and a half years, and I am well beyond that $200,000. And I do recognize that I'm a bit unique. I, I have been much more successful than uh, people often are at this stage in their career, but it does highlight that uh, that is an average range. So if you wanted to work harder, work longer, and do better, you the sky's the limit. Uh, some of the top lawyers in the big firms that are international, they're getting paid millions upon millions of dollars. I think the highest paid lawyer that's strictly in the practice of law in Canada makes about $10 million a year. And that's just because he is really, really darn good at what he does. So I, if you just want to have sort of a comfortable rhythm going, I, you're still going to get paid nicely. There are some trade-offs, which is that you're just getting paid money. Uh, with a lot of other industries, you're going to see other types of incentives. You're going to see benefits, pensions, holidays. With lawyers, it doesn't really work that way. You're not going to see pensions. You're not going to see benefits. You're just going to get that really good paycheck at the end of each month. And when it comes to holidays and work hours, 
your bosses aren't really going to care when you're in the office. If you want to work from two o'clock in the morning until noon, go for it. As long as you're getting your work done, as long as you're not uh, ignoring your clients, and as long as you are bringing in the money, then your bosses are not gonna care when you're getting that work done or how long you're working. If you are particularly efficient, then you might be able to get away with a 40 hour work week as compared to somebody who's easily distractible, spends time on Facebook, they might have to work an 80 hour week to bring in the same kind of cash that you are. Uh, so what I've mentioned there though is mainly true for small urban, mid-size and large firms. In-house counsel is a little bit different and I haven't explained that yet. In-house counsel, those are lawyers that aren't in private practice to a whole bunch of different clients. They have one client. They are hired by a single business and they are that business's lawyer. Uh, I worked with in-house counsel as a summer student at SAS Power. And so at SAS Power, they've got about five lawyers there and those lawyers only work on SAS Power issues all day, every day. And because of that, they are compensated the same way you typically see of an employee. They get those defined holidays, defined, pen, uh, defined benefits, you get the pensions, but because you've got that stability in your employment, because you've got those extra perks, you're probably going to see a little bit lower income. And uh, so then in terms of what types of supports you have, you do have, continuing professional development. It is mandatory, the Law Society of Saskatchewan and each law society within Canada require you to get a certain amount of uh, CPD. And oftentimes each of those provinces requires that about half of your time be spent on ethical issues. The reason for that is because we all have central insurance. If I make a mistake, if I screw up and uh, somebody sues me for malpractice, then our insurance is going to kick in and that could be very expensive to the legal community. So it, they want to ensure that lawyers stay up to speed. And, and we have to, because the practice of law is not like a lot of other fields. Uh, the, the laws of physics are not changing. So if you're going to be a physicist, you can learn the rules of physics and, and maybe you make new discoveries along the way because we don't know everything yet, but your foundational knowledge is not going to change. Whereas for a lawyer, every time a new set of politicians gets into government, they're going to overhaul the legal system. And that's especially true of tax and immigration because those are such hot, hot button issues. And so if you want to do tax law or immigration law, then you need to be constantly keeping up to speed, especially every time there's an election. Uh, and then you do have support from other lawyers. I, we recognize that it is a tough industry. We recognize that there's a lot of drug abuse, there's a lot of alcoholism, there's a lot of depression. So we try to lift each other up. And one of the ways that we do that is through various types of associations. You've got the Canadian Bar Association, which basically every lawyer in Canada is a part of. Uh, you've got the Saskatchewan Trial Lawyers Association. So all the barristers that really love to do trials and they focus on uh, dealing with cases that are very likely going to go to trial, uh, the Sask Trial Lawyers Association will band them together. Uh, they'll trade different arguments that they thought were persuasive to different judges. Uh, they'll give each other tools and mechanisms and training. Uh, so there are supports in place for lawyers. In terms of opportunities in the field, I, the practice of law is fantastic for people coming in right now. There is an expression called the graying of the bar. And the reason they call it that is because there are so few young lawyers that anytime you look at a lawyer, guaranteed they've got gray hair, almost guaranteed they've got gray hair. And because, and to give you an idea of how bad it is, I believe the stat is 50% of lawyers, so half 
half of all lawyers in Canada are over the age of 50, and 25% are over the age of 65. And as we've already established, lawyers make pretty good money. So 25% of the entire industry could retire tomorrow, and another 25% of the entire industry could retire in five to 10 years. So it, there is going to be a huge gap in the ability for people to find lawyers. And when you see that gap, it gives us a monopoly on services. When it comes to Mushdal, where I practice, we have at best half the number of lawyers we need, which allows me to bill a lot more than I would be able to bill in a place like Calgary or Vancouver or Toronto, where they are already adequately saturated. And so what that means is that I could work 80 hours a week and I could make a ridiculous amount of money. But for me, I choose to work a 40 hour week and, and have a very healthy amount of money rather than uh, just being miserable and rich. So if that is, there is a huge opportunity. And, and if you are interested in getting into the practice of law, you will find lawyers that are very welcoming because we need help. We need more of us around. Uh, not to mention, because we've got all of these old lawyers, you also have a huge tech knowledge gap. I find myself constantly having to explain to other lawyers about things like Snapchat and, and heck, even Facebook. I, I, my grandma uses Facebook, so I tend to assume that everybody knows what Facebook is and how to use it. And sometimes I bump into a lawyer that is like, oh yeah, that sounds familiar. That's, that's a thing on the internet, right? And so it, there is a lot of room for young lawyers to come in with a better understanding of things like Microsoft Word and Excel. And especially if you want to start getting into macros, uh, you can get paid a lot of money. And this is coming from a lawyer. You can get paid above average money if you're a lawyer that also has even just the most basic of programming understanding because every lawyer is looking for it and none of them help. When it comes to advancement, the traditional concept of moving up, you would first start out getting hired as a junior associate, then you work your butt off and you manage to become an associate, and then you work your butt off some more and you get uh, promoted to a senior associate, and you keep working your butt off all the way until you're a senior partner. And if you thought that you might be able to get away with starting to relax a bit, you'd be wrong. Because every year, all the partners get together and they decide who's not, uh, who's not keeping up, who's not earning their fair share. And if too many years in a row, you're found to be slipping and you're not working as hard as everybody else, well, then you might get kicked out of the partnership and you might get demoted back down to an associate. So if, if you're going to be in one of those big firms that are expecting you to work 60 or 80 hours a week, that is never going to end. But if you want to get out of those big firms, you can. You can always move to in-house counsel, you can move to a smaller community, or you can try to become a judge. And if you're going to become a judge, then you're basically entered into a popularity contest where all the lawyers in the province are going to uh, take a look to see who is deemed worthy of being shortlisted to become a judge. And then the politicians will review that shortlist and make a decision about who on that shortlist is going to become a judge. From there, you've got judges at the provincial court level, Queen's Bench, Court of Appeal, and finally, the Supreme Court of Canada. And that picture you see on the screen, that is the Supreme Court of Canada. Very Christmas festive, but that's actually their outfit that they wear all the time. And the Supreme Court of Canada, despite their very colorful outfits, they hold basically just as much power among the nine of them as the executive branch of government. So the prime minister and his cabinet, uh, they'll hold the same amount of power as the Supreme Court of Canada. And 
So if you're the type of person that really wants to influence uh, the country, you could take the political route or you could try to become a judge. And as a judge, you can interpret legislation. You can decide that legislation runs contrary to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and you can really help to shape the future of Canada. I've got uh, benchers listed. Those benchers are the ones that actually run the law society. So they get to decide how lawyers govern themselves, how lawyers practice, and how they have to, how they have to do their work on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, getting into politics is fairly common for lawyers because we tend to get so frustrated with poorly drafted legislation that creates ambiguity, creates unintended negative consequences. We get so frustrated with it that we decide, okay, I need to uh, become politically active and I need to start fighting for a change uh, right from the source rather than downstream as a lawyer. When it comes to related fields, I already touched on it a little bit. Everything is a related field to law. You can get into video game law, you can get into space law, you can get into uh, tax law, trade law, criminal law, family law, you can get into agricultural law, uh, you can get into biochemical research law. There is an area of law for every single other job in the world. And, and in fact, there are a few areas of law that don't even have other jobs associated with them. Uh, that is actually how I became a lawyer. When I got out of high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I went into business thinking, oh, I could take a business degree and I could go anywhere. Well, as I was getting towards the end of my business degree, I still had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to do business. So then I went into law and when I got uh, partway through my law degree, I realized, you know, I think I just really want to be a lawyer. And here I am several years later, and I'm loving it. So from there, uh, I've touched already again on work-life balance. Uh, you do have some control over that, but it also de depends where you are geographically and what type of job you want. If you want to go in-house counsel, yeah, absolutely. You can have work-life balance. You can work eight to five. Uh, you can have up to six weeks holidays. Uh, some businesses even like eight or 10 weeks holidays, which is fantastic. And you are not expected to work overtime. But if you're going to be working on Bay Street in uh, Toronto, which is the Canadian version of Wall Street in New York, then you're going to be, it's going to be essential that you're working 80 hours a week and there is no choice. You get to decide when that is and typically you're, you'd be expected to be there 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. but you could decide if you're working 24 hours straight and, and taking a nice weekend or you could decide that you're going to work, uh, instead of working eight hours a day, you'll work 16 hours a day and take a weekend off, uh, those types of things. So it is quite flexible um, and once you get sort of more of a happy medium, and I like to think that I'm at that happy medium, I might work 40 to 50 hours a week typically, but if I want to take a whole month off, there is nobody that's going to stop me. I, I've already made as much money as, as I'm looking to make in the year, and so if I decide I just want to take December off, I can do that. And even if you're in a small partnership with other partners, if you can show that you worked your butt off, uh, for the other 11 months of the year, why not take a whole month off? And the other partners can't complain about it. So there is a lot of flexibility in terms of when you want to take time off, when you want to take holidays, and if you just never want to take time off, never want to take holidays, and you want to work a crazy amount of overtime, you could make do good money doing that too. And so now we've reached the end of our presentation, and I'm wondering if we have any questions that I can answer for you. What an awesome presentation. Thank you. And thanks for being so transparent with your, um, with your material too. I think it's always so important to, you know, know exactly what the wage is and exactly the, you know, the expectation that, you know, this career can offer to students. Um, but I'm going to ask um, a question as if I was a student. If I'm in grade 12 right now, considering law as my profession, what should I know as a student and what should I be considering 
um, just any suggestions or tips that you could offer to a high school student right now? Yes, if you are considering law, the biggest thing to keep in mind is uh, your biggest hurdle in your entire career is going to be getting into law school. That is the most challenging aspect of becoming a lawyer. And once you actually manage to get into law school, then law school itself, it's, it's challenging, but you'll make it through. And passing the bar, it can be challenging, but you'll make it through. And the practice of law can be challenging, but you'll make it through. So getting into law school, that is the biggest hurdle. In order to get into law school in Canada, you need a bare minimum of two years of undergrad. And it can be undergrad in whatever. You can be taking business classes. You can be going for a music major in the Bachelor of Arts and Science. I, I went to school with a toxicology major. And so it, it doesn't really matter what you're doing with that first two years, except that you need to make sure that you're getting good marks. And when I say you're getting good marks, you're gonna to wanna to be shooting for 80% average or more. If you get less than an 80% average, then you're going to have to really do well on the LSAT. And the LSAT, I believe it stands for the Law, the law School Aptitude Test, something along those lines. And the LSAT is usually weighed equally to your undergrad average. And the LSAT is also weighed relative to every other person writing the LSAT. So uh, if you want to be competitive getting into a law school when you've got a, an 80% average with your undergrad, then you're going to want to score about a 160 on the LSAT. If you only have a 60% average in undergrad, well, you're, you're going to need to do phenomenally on that LSAT if you're even going to stand a chance. Uh, a near perfect score would probably be necessary at that point. And then when they take your LSAT and they take your grades, they'll also consider to a certain extent any other extenuating circumstances. So one of the guys that I went to school with, uh, he was a, an Olympian. And so he didn't have great marks, he didn't do great on the LSAT, but he was in the Olympics. And he made the pitch that uh, he was making his athletics, he was making the Olympics his priority. His school was not a priority at the time. His LSAT was not a priority at the time. The Olympics was his priority. And now that he's done with the Olympics, he will make law school a priority if he's given that opportunity. And he was given that opportunity and he did quite well in law school. So uh, there is always a chance, but doing well on that law, uh, the law student aptitude test and doing well day to day in your first two years of undergrad, those are going to make a very big difference. Awesome, thank you so much for addressing that LSAT because I think a lot of students have questions in regards to that specific test. Just going back to your, uh, it kind of in relation to why there's a major, major shortage of lawyers right now. Um, is it because why? Why in your opinion is that, is that happening right now? There are two big things. The first one is that the universities didn't realize that there would be this increased demand until it was too late. Uh, so for a lot of law schools across the country, they hadn't increased their class sizes in decades. And they, the University of Saskatchewan, when I went through, they had just recently increased the class size to 120. Uh, but before that, it was 60 people. And we've had a growing population, and we have not had a growing population of lawyers. And of those 60 or of those 120 that were let in, you usually see about 10% uh, dropout, uh, maybe a bit more, because you might see it drop from 120 students to 100 who graduate. And once you have those graduates, not all of them will stay in the practice of law, uh, particularly uh, women who want to enjoy a work-life balance, they want to have a family, they get out into the practice and they realize that they're not particularly welcome there. Uh, if you want to work in a big center, then you're going to have to work hard. You have to choose 
and, and some firms are as blatant as giving an ultimatum. If you want to raise a family, then you're going to need to do it without being on our payroll. And I mean, there's even some human rights issues with that, uh, but that's how extreme it can be sometimes. So if uh, you'll see probably another 20% drop off uh, within the first five years of practice because it can be such a dark, stressful, and time, all time consuming industry. Uh, for those that then make it through their first five years or those that thrive in that type of industry, uh, then it's great for them, but uh, it's not great for society because it costs way too much money to get a lawyer for most people, and then it creates a barrier to accessing justice. Wow, thank you so much for addressing that. Uh, and there is another question from the office here. Yes, I, I, you said you practice in general terms, so what area do you find the most rewarding, I guess? And the second part, which one would make the most money of all areas, do you think? For making the most money, uh, especially in the smaller centers where we do not have enough lawyers at all, you're going to make the most money on the solicitor side. And the reason is because on the solicitor side, you have all those precedents. And once you have a good enough body of precedents because you've been in practice for a while, you've seen a lot of the same issues and you're able to rely on previous documents you've drafted, at that point, you can train a legal assistant to do 95% of the work. And then you just review the legal assistant's work, make sure it's accurate, make sure that uh, the proper sections of the legislation are quoted and, and then sign off on it. And from there, you build the practice so that you have two, three, maybe even four legal assistants that are doing all the work, all of the heavy lifting, and then you're just reviewing it for accuracy. But that's all happening on the back end. The client doesn't necessarily know how much of the work is being done by a legal assistant and how much is being done by a lawyer. And so you can charge lawyer rates for the work and, and then you're obviously not paying the legal assistant nearly as much as perhaps they uh, have contributed in terms of value. Uh, for lawyers that have successfully uh, built that model, they could be working a comfortable 40 hours a week and maybe getting paid as much as $400,000 a year. So that is how you want to make your money, if that's all you're interested in. Um, but in terms of um, the most rewarding areas, those will tend to be on the barrister side because you're helping people that are dealing with very difficult issues in their life. Um, it creates more stress for you because if you lose those cases, then uh, you, for some people, there's a risk that you fall into a depression because you, you feel like you've let down the client and that an injustice has been done. Um, but assuming you're able to help them win it, then it's a huge high and it's a huge rush knowing that you have contributed to justice being done and helping this person out of a very dark place in their life. Uh, for, for me, I, I find that tends to happen most on the family law side. Uh, so if, if I'm representing somebody who wants more time with their children, and I know that this person genuinely loves their children, and that's why they're trying to get more time, and we see the, and then at the end of the trial or at the end of negotiations, we see that my client is able to get that time, then uh, that brings joy to my heart. Um, could, could you quickly tell us about the articling process? Yes. So once you get through, once you get into law school, uh, you've got three years. And assuming you pass all your classes and everything in those three years, then you get your law degree. But your law degree is not where it ends. You don't actually have your license to practice at that point. So in order to get your license to practice law, you need to article. And that is a one-year process. It's very much like a medical internship, um, but we call it articling because we want to be different. And that, uh, that articling process, you're shadowing another more experienced lawyer for one full year while you're going through uh, we now call it CPLED, but you'd probably hear it 
referred to as the bar. And so you go through uh, the bar exam process and assuming you pass all of those tests and you pass the bar and you've done your one year of articling, now you have your license to practice, you're a full-fledged lawyer and the sky's the limit. Thank you, Talon. I don't know if there are any more questions from the authors. Actually, I think you addressed everything that we had thought about asking you. So thank you so much. This was a very good, very good. Absolutely. You're very welcome. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Bye.